Well, hi, everybody. I'm glad you were able to join us today. We're here with Jason Cohen, founder and CEO of Gastrograph AI. Hey, Jason, how you doing? Very good, Jerry. Happy to be here. Yeah, me too. This is, we've got a lot to discuss. Uh, but first, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and Gastrograph AI and give us a brief explanation about what it is and why you believe it's particularly important now. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So I'm Jason, founder and CEO of Analytical Flavor Systems. Uh, my background, I started as a professional tea taster. It is a real job and a full tea room behind me. Uh, I spent a whole bunch of time in mainland China, Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. Went to Penn State University where I started a tea research group uh, that uh, kind of spiraled out of control, became an interdisciplinary tea research institute called the Tea Institute of Penn State. That was exactly as popular as it sounds, really competed with the football, football team for funding and turnout. But despite that, I had 30 something students, five fields of study. Uh, I did my research originally in sensory science, science of taste, and then moved to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I did that for just about four years. And when everything started to work, we could actually make predictions around what people taste and like and dislike in food and beverage products, realize it didn't belong in academia anymore, spun it off from the university, and we all started analytical flavor systems together. So that's, uh, that's, that's my background. That's a pretty good one. Um, what does Gastrograph do? So we Why have, are you here? Yeah. So we have an, an AI platform that models human sensory perception of flavor, aroma, and texture to predict consumer preference of food and beverage products. So we help companies develop new products, optimize existing brands, and enter new markets, all from the perspective of making better, more targeted flavor profiles for specific consumer demographics around the world. We always say more diverse products for a more diverse world. Right. Interesting. So that's your mission, vision kind of statement. Well, that's good because today we're, we're going to discuss, uh, obviously, the title of, of our discussion and conversation today is the past, the present, and the future of product development. So it's a pretty good segue to that. Let me kick it off by saying that new product development is a source of inspiration. It always has been uh, for me personally in my life and for you as well now and for many other entrepreneurs who revitalize our world, basically, with new and I guess sometimes really amazing products uh, through taste, form, texture, aroma. Uh, I think it also enhances revenues uh, when companies uh, create something that's, that takes off, that's a hit. Um, but this idea of new and revitalized um, continues to push us all forward. So I think today, like much else in our lives, fortunately or unfortunately, we're at a crossroads in the consumer packaged goods industry as well, right? So for those people who are not historians, who are listening in and watching us and uh, taking in our message, um, can you explain what do you mean by the nature of CPG? Um, you know, why is it fundamentally changing? Why are we at this crossroads and what is, what constitutes this crossroads? Yeah, um, I would be happy to, but Jerry, maybe before I do that, maybe you should introduce yourself. Oh yeah, sure. I just popped on here. I'm just a regular consumer that was very interested by the title. Um, I am the current uh, brand and marketing advisor of Gastrograph. You and I have known each other since at least uh, 2016 and, uh, my past has been really strategy and advertising and communications. Uh, I started in Europe, in France particularly, and worked with uh, some of the big guys out there, Procter & Gamble, Unilever for many years, and got to understand this uh, world that we're talking about, which is food and beverage. And I also created my own um, cachaça, which is a Brazilian spirit called Leblon, and uh, understood the entrepreneurial idea, or at least I scratched that urge in myself over the years. And so this is a really interesting title for me uh, because I do believe um, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. It's a big thing now. People talk about it now for many years. And we see a plethora of products, certainly in the food and beverage industry coming out. You can walk into Whole, Whole Foods at any one time and see New, 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 you know, new products all over the place. Uh, so I believe this is really a situation of uh, inspiration, change, newness, 
Um, it's really pretty interesting. So I'm curious as to how you think and why uh, the nature of consumer packaged goods is fundamentally changed. And uh, well, um, you're, you're too humble to say, but your, your venture was quite successful, right? You sold, you, you sold that to Bacardi. Yeah, Bacardi was an interested partner at the beginning and they grew with us and finally bought the entire company. And it's still within their product portfolio worldwide. Yeah. So, so you got to face, um, you know, we've talked about this extensively, but you've got to face many of those challenges of, of taking a, um, a product that existed in another country and then bringing it here to the United States and needing to both educate the consumer, localize the product's flavor, and then figure out how to combine that product with new flavors in order to appeal to new and changing uh, consumer cohorts and changing demographics. Yep. And so, you know, what I think has happened over um, the last decade, certainly, um, but even longer, is that consumer preferences continue to evolve and the pace of that evolution is increasing that it used to be that consumers were accepting of the ideas of regional or national or even international products. Um, but now consumers expect, and, and you know, we, we actually have a, a slide for this, but consumers expect products to fit their preferences. They no longer fit themselves into a box. Um, they're much more willing to choose and to assert, um, these are the types of things I like, or these are the types of product attributes that I demand. And this is true on the, the flavor side, certainly. And it's also true on the types of things that they're willing to consume. So we know that the market is go, grow, going clean label. When they go clean label, they have to remove a bunch of sweeteners, preservatives, additives, or, or you know, artificial flavors. Uh, but consumers then expect the product to taste the same or better. Um, consumers are demanding products to be healthier, not just clean label, but lower sugar, lower fat, uh, no unsaturated fat. But again, then they expect the product to taste the same or better. And so, you know, consumers are becoming more demanding. Um, consumers are becoming more sensitive to uh, their options uh, and to the values that brands propose. Uh, and it has never been cheaper. It's never been more. It's never been more possible to launch a new consumer brand. So we saw during the 2008 financial crisis, a bunch of companies pulled back on innovation, and a bunch of direct-to-consumer brands and a bunch of uh, what, what our customers call heel biters uh, will, you know, emerged uh, in order to take that market share. And so, you know, it's not just, it's not just that um, the consumer has changed. It's also that the industry has changed and the use of co-packers, the use of uh, direct to direct to consumer distribution networks, the, the, the use of uh, online and e-commerce channels allow for a type of micro targeting that has never been possible before. And it means that consumers are then exposed to new flavors they are exposed to things that meet their preferences. And then they demand that um, from the major brands that are available in retail or that are available uh, where, where they shop, that they can go and they, they, can, uh, they can find it. Uh, it's interesting. It's like, I remember when in, in, the, in, the, in the world of restaurants, and I think we've all seen this, how there, there became a fusion of cuisines, you know, you, you would see Cuban and Chinese, you would see Japanese and, and, and Costa Rican, you would see also, and now this has gone into products, as you say, where products have now become um, incredibly interesting in terms of taste portfolio and all the rest of it. So I guess we have, you know, we do want products. We expect products now to fit uh, our lifestyles and our tastes, um, all of us as individuals, I think as well. Um, the problem is, in this fundamentally changed CPG world, uh, what are the barriers that the, the larger companies are facing? I mean, what's going on here for them? And so th this, this is an example that I frequently use, is that is the idea that it used to be that companies could win because of scale and distribution, right? That companies right. That, could, that, that could manufacture a product in mass, distribute it nationally, uh, had a built-in competitive advantage. Um, but we don't believe that to be the case anymore, right? Now, uh, consumers expect products to be targeted. They expect to have products that they love. And you see this across uh, multiple industries, right? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was no kombucha, right? Five years ago or 10 years ago, uh, there was, depending on where you were in, in the United States or in the world, 
Uh, there were a couple of flavors of kombucha, right? There was mostly the original flavors and maybe one or two other flavors. Now you walk into a supermarket and there are 30 flavors of kombucha eaten by six brands, right? You have an entire wall of it. Right. And it's because as soon as a market becomes competitive, flavor becomes the differentiator. And flavor is the differentiator because today's consumer demands a product that they like. And so, you know, traditional ideas around brand loyalty, traditional ideas around what it means to have a, to, to, to have a consumer um, that likes your product are also changing, right? Um, someone in the olden days who bought olden days, 10, 10, 10, 15, even, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, so if you called someone's, I'm, I'm going to make something up, right? But a, a, a Budweiser consumer, that Budweiser consumer was drinking Budweiser, right? They weren't going off and exploring other products. They weren't going off and trying uh, variations in craft beer, right? Whereas today, Budweiser, um, if, if they haven't already, they should redefine what it means to be a Budweiser consumer. Anyone who's willing to buy Budweiser at, at a ball game, at a venue, on an on-premise, right, is a Budweiser consumer. And it's fine if they go if they don't have that same type of brand loyalty, and they go out and they purchase uh, other products if they're in an exploratory preference state. So, you know, one of the questions is how does a brand like that keep someone in their value ladder? How do you say, okay, we know that they're going to explore. We know that they're not just going to stick with Budweiser, right? Where are they going to move? What, what's, what is their decision tree to, to climb that value ladder? If they're going to go, you know, some people are going to branch off and maybe go into light beer. Um, but most people are probably going to go from that maybe to something like Bud Premium or Bud Heavy. Uh, maybe to one of the ABI owned um, uh, premium brands maybe from the premium brands to one of their super premium brands or one of their super premium imports, and maybe from that to one of their wholly owned craft breweries. That type of value ladder, right, shows how different today's situation is, how different it is, to what it means to need to create product portfolios for the experience and the consumer evolution uh, uh, versus, right, uh, having someone who's loyal to your brand for a lifetime. And that's key. That's, that, that's the, to me, in my life, as a marketer and advertiser, consumer, entrepreneur, that is key because the dialectic has completely flipped 180 degrees. Um, I recall one time working on a, a, a new product development for a chocolate bar in Europe. Uh, our Nestle uh, client came up to me and said, listen, we need to make a huge, a, a huge product here, like much like the Mars bar, like the Lion bar out of the UK, which was huge winners across all of Europe. And I said, why would you want to do that? They taste so insipid and bland. Why would you want to do it? And he looked at me like I was crazy, obviously. Um, back in those days, he was saying, the whole idea of, uh, of, of a product that we want to launch to make money was, is that we want to create a chocolate bar that's bland for national mass consumption. And he went on to explain that every time a product has a particular flavor or taste that pops out, that's, uh, that's announcing in it, that's uh, some of the products that you're talking about that are very different and targeted, they get less than mass consumption. In other words, their audience becomes much more targeted and less mass. And so uh, today's world is the opposite. Today's world is what you're describing is targeted products can now come onto the market and find their niche against their audiences because their audiences really love what they have to say and how they taste and what their flavor is. Back in those days, that it was the opposite was true. Yep, I, I, I entirely agree with that. I mean, it, you know, we, we just did an art, we were just interviewed by eater.com and an article uh, about why potato chips um, here in the United States are, have less exciting flavors but less exploratory flavors than say some of the, the Pelé roti, the roast chicken chips available in France, uh, then the gochujang flavored spicy, uh, spicy and sweet chili sauce uh, from South Korea. Uh, one of my favorites, the honey butter chips from South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's that idea. It's that m most of the products are still lowest common denominator products. You have to be able to move a certain number of products before it's gonna get attention. And in the United States, it's a large diverse market, right? That, that product has to have mass appeal. Right. And so, you know, one of the things that we want to help companies do is use the technology um, to reduce the cost of innovation. So it's possible instead of spending a year or, or two or three years, right, in an R&D cycle and an iterative uh, formulation cycle, 
is to actually be able to target uh, these consumer segments, is to actually be able to say, you know what, I'm going to have one brand. That brand is going to have six flavors in it. And each of those flavors is going to be targeted as a segment. And so we're going to have people who like the spicy. We're going to have people who like the, the salty. We're going to have people who like the acidic. We're going to have people who like uh, the mommy and meaty. And we're going to be able to, to craft this brand so that everyone, so that we have high coverage, right? 75, 80, 90% coverage uh, of the target consumer demographic in the, in the regions where we're planning on distributing. And I think that that leads to a lot um, more innovative products. I think it leads to products that people love rather than like. Uh, and I think it leads to a higher level of competitive value um, where people are going to come back to that product again and again and again. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because in, in that article, and I, I happened to come across that article, I read it, you actually stated that the process is broken because the, those things are not occurring as fast as perhaps some people uh, would like. Um, so I think we, we're moving away from mass. We're going to have more interesting flavors and more interesting products, which is great for us all who who love innovation and love new products, um, that's going to mean um, a lot of challenges to the traditional NPD approach. One of them being, as you're saying, portfolio management skills. I mean, people, uh, companies are going to have to now manage more different and differentiated products in the same region than they did perhaps before, right? Absolutely. So, so what are the challenges here? We have basically three that we're mentioning here, unreliable disposable data, data scarcity, and restricted innovation. What's going on? Yeah. These challenges. So the, the, the challenges, um, so the unreliable disposable data, we'll talk more about this, uh, but the way that consumer research uh, is done today is based predominantly on frequent statistical hypothesis testing. It's uh, using screened panelists, screened consumers, bringing them in, asking them questions, um, sometimes on well-designed studies, sometimes on things like jar scales. Um, and then that data is only usable once. You're not using that data to build up a database that you can make reliable predictions from. What you're doing is building an experimental design to say which of these two products do people like more, which of these two products do people like less? Is there a difference between these products? Um, and what the, the, the problem with that right, is that that data is expensive, that's part of the data scarcity, right. and that data is only usable to answer one question, and that data doesn't generalize. And so that means that companies now, instead of saying, you know what, this is a more competitive environment, we need to do more innovative work, we need to do more consumer testing, we need to be more consumer driven, they're saying this is so expensive, it doesn't really increase the chance of our product being successful, we're going to test less products. Um, so a pullback on that type of innovation, right? Just using a, a, a allowing a product to launch onto the market with less testing and saying, well, we'll you know we'll we'll get some consumer feedback and we'll fix it later. The problem is, right? The the internet remembers everything forever now. So if you launch a product and customers don't like it, someone's right. going to complain. And people really do look up uh, uh, reviews on on product review sites before deciding what types of products to buy. I or they, they try it once and they're never going to come back to it. You're going to burn and churn through it. And so um, the last thing is a little bit different. The restricted innovation, that's a, that's a, a, a slightly different um, critique of the, the traditional or the challenges of the traditional method. That's the idea that if you are a chip company, you're only going to test chips. If you're, uh, if you're um, a beef jerky company, you're only going to test beef jerky. If you are... Uh, say, uh, uh, an alcoholic beverage company, you're going to test predominantly alcoholic beverages. And so you don't get the benefit from cross-category or cross-cultural learnings. And because the testing is restricted, because the testing is expensive, uh, these companies will, will recruit screen panels who are either category users or product level users. They'll ask them questions about their product and their top competitor, uh, maybe a couple of other products. Um, but they're not actually learning anything around the changes in the experiences that consumers have. They're not learning anything about uh, the experiences that are available in other countries. They're not learning anything about how to bring new individuals who are not yet uh, brand or category consumers into the fold. And so, you know, I think one of the challenges there, one of the reasons that the in innovation we see is so incremental uh, is because there's no other source of data and information that leads to, to, to more revolutionary approaches. 
And that's why you see a lot of the small brands, the niche brands, right, that, that start with some inspiration, uh, make much bigger changes. And it's not that they're more successful, it's that there's, there's more of them willing to try uh, uh, you know, crazier ideas. Um, and, I, and I think we can bring that type of inspiration into the enterprise and, and make a much larger impact uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with, with much greater levels of innovation. It's interesting. We have a question from the audience that uh, basically says, uh, if traditional sensory methods are not corresponding to today's consumers, then why do companies rely upon them? Yeah, um, I think there are two reasons. I think, you know, one is they're relying on them less uh, because like, like I said, customers are responding to this by actually, um, uh, CBGs are responding to this by actually doing less consumer testing. On the other hand, right, they, many of these companies have dedicated functions for consumer research and those are important functions, right? There are other questions that, that those groups can answer around uh, packaging, supply chain, distribution, price points, uh, marketing claims. Um, shelf space, right? Those, those are important. Those are real legitimate concerns, right? Um, that's not what we're critiquing. On the flavor side, uh, I think a lot of it is about what the technology that's available and what they're used to comparing things to in the past, right? There's always going to be a friction for, for change. Um, and so a lot of that friction is legitimate. If you have a way that's worked for, you know, uh, if you're a very old company, 100 years, Right. Um, there's there's good reasons not to change. Not everyone adopted uh, computers. Not everyone adopted typewriters. We'll go even further back immediately. Right. You still had uh, uh, secretaries and stenographs for, for, for quite a while. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and it took a while before everyone adopted the typewriter. And then it took a while before everyone adopted computers. And then it took a while before everyone adopt, adopted the Internet. So I do think we're seeing a change. And I think that that change is unevenly distributed. And I think that that change has a lot to do with the, the level of appetite for, for change management and technological risk uh, that exists within CPG. Okay, so we're still in early days. We are still in early days. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, yeah. I was, I was just gonna remind everyone. So uh, we, uh, there is a Q and A. So Jerry just asked a question from the audience, but there is a Q and A button. So we can see those so if anyone has a question. Um, Please uh, contribute. Yes, yeah. I'll read them off. I'll in. definitely read them off. There are a few. Um, just before you get into this, I've heard you say that many new product development processes are flawed. Uh, and to be competitive, CPG companies need to adopt new systems, which is what we just talked about a little bit. Um, so there is there were, we're in early days, but there's still a kind of an out of step feeling here, isn't there? There is. There is. I mean, we're, we see, you know, the, uh, the, the standard statistics is about 85, 90% of new product developments fail within their first three years on the market. You know, and I think that that um, statistic is probably an underestimate because it doesn't show all of the innovation that doesn't make it to the market that's, that gets killed in uh, good or bad consumer testing. And it doesn't take into account um, products that had a chance of success, right, and were and and failed for for other reasons. Whether you know those are things I mentioned before, like uh, pricing, branding, distribution, supply chain. So um, there does seem to be a, a lag, but I think that that lag is 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 actually what's opened up uh, room for us to operate it. Um, you know, there is um, we we I started doing this research in 2009, became a company in 2013, right? Really officially launched October, October 2016, and the difference that we've seen from when we started in, in 2009, 12 years ago, right, to what we see today is, you know, uh, when we started, people would say, "What is food technology?" Right? What does what does that mean? Um, you know, when we when we launched, people would say, "Yeah, you know, this is, it seems like a lot of change. It seems like it's going to be difficult to to implement. We don't really know about this whole AI thing, right? Like, no, right. this is this is a real customer, uh, well, not a customer quote, but this is a real quote from a from a from a sales call. Someone said to me, "Why do I need artificial intelligence? Right? I have human intelligence in the company." Um, and <laughs> Good question. <laughs> you know? And um, yeah, so. So, you know, obviously the, the, um, the, the, the state of the industry, not just the, the condition, the market conditions, but the, 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 the philosophy of the, 
of, of executives in the industry, the, the, the philosophy of operators in the industry has really changed, right? We no longer get asked, what is this AI thing, right? We say, how can I leverage AI, right? I've been mandated to, to find a way to apply AI to my problems. Yeah, they're starting to realize that AI um, that, that, that is well built and, and functioning correctly can in fact deliver, uh, if not uh, whole systems of solutions, at least parts of them. And I think that's really important. That's a good thing. It's good movement. Um, you know, and as we look at the traditional methods that they're slowly moving away from, we see a lot of the challenges that we started talking about earlier, but now we see a lot of the limitations um, in, in really the, the empirical data collections. Yeah. I mean, there's really serious lag, um, not just in lag time in adopting uh, new methods, but there's a serious uh, lag uh, between uh, and among the methods, at least the future methods uh, with the traditional. Yeah, and that, that's what I want to talk about here. So when we think about um, traditional sensory, we're talking about tools and techniques like um, CLTs and the types of testing that goes on in CLTs. Uh, home use tests and uh, the type of testing that goes on in home use tests. And that includes things like difference panels, difference tests, similarity tests, stack rank hedonic tests. And so, you know, the problem that I started to mention is that um, using static empirical data, it means that every single question requires a new test, right? If you want to know if products are different, you run a difference test. If you want to know if products are similar, you run a similarity test. If you want to know if one product is liked more than the other, you have to run a preference test. If you want to know if two people can tell, if people can tell the difference between two products, uh, you run a 60-40 test or, right, um, or a triangle, um, so on and on and on. And that data is static empirical data that can't be used to make predictions about the future. It can only be used to answer the question designed uh, in, that, in that experiment. And so what we believe is that that leads to disposable insights, that data is only ever used once, um, which means that it's a cost center, it means that there's no ROI in collecting bigger, better, more descriptive data sets. And it leads to a lot of guesswork because if you don't, if, if you have to design the experiment before you know what questions to ask, right, then you don't, then you're not, you're not being responsive to the data, right? You're going to, to, sh to shape or to skew the questions you, you ask based on that intuition. And then, you know, best case scenario, even when this all works, um, we believe that it results in low fidelity descriptors. Those low fidelity descriptors are consumer sensory attributes where a consumer says, I think it's too sweet, I think it's too salty. And um, you know, the reality is, is that consumers are very, very good at knowing what they like. They're very, very bad at knowing why they like or dislike something. And um, you know, I, the, the, the example I use of that is uh, I went to Atlanta and I, was, I hadn't been to the world of Coke in years. And um, they have uh, in the world of Coke, they have the pet, the, the Coke, the, the Coke freestyle machine. And you can, that's the machine where you can design your own soda. And you can walk up to that and you can say, you know what, I like uh, Coke, I like vanilla Coke. And so I'm going to do a Coke with extra vanilla, right? And what I, what I did, I sat back and watched consumers go up to the machine, put it, you know, do the glass and drink and say, this, right? And they didn't like it because what they didn't realize is that. They didn't, they, they didn't like extra vanilla. They liked the hint of vanilla. They liked an appropriate amount of vanilla for the, for the rest of that labor profile. And consumers aren't formulators, right? And so asking them what they think they like versus what they actually like um, results in a lot of um, uh, misguided consumer directed design. If you can even translate it, what, what, what it is that they mean by those terms. Um, right, right. And so in response to that, right, we, we see four key benefits of a predictive framework. Um, one is obviously predictive power, being able to collect a data set and leverage that data set to gain greater and larger insights as we continuously collect more data from around the world uh, means that the AI is uh, always learning, right, always up to date, uh, and it's always going to be able to draw new inspiration from new data and keep up with contemporary perceptions and preferences. Um, and that's possible because it's question agnostic. We ask the same thing every time, right? And that's what do you perceive in the product in front of you? How much do you like it? And we can then replicate all of the existing tooling. So we can use that data for difference testing, similarity testing, preference testing, uh, consumer guided feedback and design, 
uh, product optimizations, right? Anything that you would need to traditionally design an experiment for, the AI can replicate based on its question agnostic design. And so that all allows us to do compound learning, which is where the AI constantly is able not just to make uh, better and more up-to-date predictions, but higher resolution predictions around the flavors, aromas, and textures that are relevant to the products undergoing analysis. So the AI, you know, we, we just launched in India. We're very, very excited about that. Um, we've had a, teams deployed there for, for about seven weeks so far, bringing on seven regions uh, within India. It's one of the most diverse data, data sets that we've ever collected. And the AI is learning new flavors. We, we, we sent a team in India right, to go profile new products to learn that demographic. But one of the most amazing things is we're already seeing that data being used in other projects totally unrelated to the Indian market. right? Here in the United States, being able to draw inspiration from, from uh, new applications of curry leaf, new applications uh, of the way that they use uh, spice blends, various types of masala spice blends, right? variations even in the types of spices that are available. It's a different type of cardamom uh, that's predominantly used in, in India uh, than we see elsewhere in the world. And so, you know, when we talk about compound learning, it's really about how do you take, how do you continuously derive new value from existing data? Um, so that's the, interesting. You're actually saying now that the AI, that gastrograph AI, has been learning inputs, been gathering inputs from India and is already applying some of that learning outside of the Indian market? Already applying that learning outside the Indian market. So we have all of the data that we collected say here in the United States, the AI learns new flavors in India and it goes back and it's able to update all of the flavor profiles we've ever seen. And then say, actually we didn't, we weren't able to predict this before, but we can predict now that switching this from green cardamom to black cardamom uh, would, would be a major improvement. That's incredible. What's the time frame in this that, that you've been able to, to, to see this learning occur? Matter so, of months? No, uh, uh, days to weeks. So when we first- Oh my Lord. It, <laughs> That's so, <fast>. so, <laughs> Talk yeah, about um, time to market and speed, <laughs> speed to, to, to knowledge. Oh my God. That's amazing. That's very cool. Very cool. I mean, just that alone should wake up some of the traditional companies that we've been talking about and saying, hey, <laughs> look, look at how fast this can, this can iterate. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, so I have uh, two, uh, basically, I'm, I'm getting a few questions from the audience. Uh, let me put them into two parts. Um, how does the AI understand flavor, aroma, texture, that can drive consumer product preferences. How do they? How does it understand it? Yeah. So we have uh, three sources of data. We have standing panels uh, in New York and Shanghai. The, those are uh, about fifty people that taste uh, about twelve products a day every day, Monday through Friday, um, constantly iterating through. Um, uh, anything interesting, innovative, new. We look for product releases. We look for product pulls. Um, and uh, some of that is local to the market, some of it is imported, um, shipped directly to us. And so they're constantly profiling. And that is really looking to expand the data set in terms of products. Right. Um, we have a children's panel, uh, so we can predict children's preferences down to eight years old. And then in addition to that, we have what we call our forward deployed tactical global panel team. That's a team that literally circles the world to a different city, different country, different region every week. Um, they have a rapid uh, uh, grab and deploy methodology. So they spin up a panel, about 100 people. Um, uh, sample sizes vary depending on the country. 80 to 100 people is normal in India, where I think we're doing four times that. I think it's 400 people per city. Um, and so they have them taste 80 to 100 on market CPG products over the course of five days on average. And so what that allows us to do is it parameterizes the perception, it parameterizes the distributions of perception. So we understand what, what it is that they're perceiving. And then we use that data to the, the market survey data about the on-market products to reverse engineer the preferences that are driving those, those, that, that market. And so what that allows us to do is to collect a flavor profile anywhere and then to predict how that flavor profile will perform using empirical data drawn from target consumers in the target country. Um, within that target demographic. So it's built on real consumer data. 100% of our models are built on real consumer data 
of having people tasting products. And I think that that's a real differentiator from trying to use uh, social listening, trend forecasting, or, or sales analytics. It's, it's people tasting products. We, we've not taken any shortcuts on that. That's great. The other question that's kind of, uh, kind of dovetails with that is uh, how do you help companies harness the predictive knowledge that you generate? Yeah. And so, um, perfect segue for this slide. Uh, we, we, you know, we have um, designed our tools to, to help companies have an impact at any stage of the development cycle. Everything from concepting, which is what should I make, right? To targeting, I have a product, who's gonna like it? And is there anything I can do to this product to make them like it more? So a frequent application of that is what we call lift and shift you have a successful product in the United States, you wanted to bring it to Europe, what countries in Europe are going to like it? Um, or do you have to change anything, right? Is there an optimization path to make that product successful? Uh, we have formulation tools. So pretty frequently companies will send us to work with their outsourced uh, formulators, whether that's flavor houses or other types of R&D partners, or we'll work in-house. Um, and then it's used uh, uh, a lot by uh, innovation teams and R&D teams to, to figure out what's coming next. So, you know, between um, the, we, we, we think of this as a product life cycle application. Um, and then within each of the teams uh, in the enterprise, we have um, different types of applications that, that can be deployed. So R&D teams, we use this for, for formulation, for rapid prototype development, uh, for innovation testing. Brand marketing will use us to understand uh, what products in which countries, which consumers. Um, you know, the United States is a diverse market, is going to be liked on East Coast versus West Coast. Um, we have independent models for Asian American, African American, Hispanic American, and Anglo Saxon. Um, does it need to be demographically targeted? Does it need to be income bracket targeted? And those are the types of questions for brand marketing, regional sales and distribution, um, similar types of questions. Uh, and executive teams to, under, to, 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 to keep their finger on what changes they expect to see. Uh, new entrants by competitors, large scale shifts in consumer preference, either due to uh, systemic behavioral changes due to something like COVID uh, or due to a new wave of uh, products or health trends or uh, effects being driven throughout the market. I mean, just think about the prevalence of turmeric in non-traditionally turmeric driven products, right? So if some people, turmeric may or may not be healthy, uh, I have a personal skepticism of soft claims, um, but turmeric, a lot of people believe it's anti-inflammatory. And, uh, um, you know, we went from a situation where people, if you would have tried to give someone golden milk, turmeric flavored milk, right? Um, they would have, <laughs> what, what, what is this, right? right? And now people order it because they've gained a preference for it. So repeat exposure to flavor um, yields perceptual differences that cause new preference adaptation, which cause new, new acquisition of new preferences and new habits. And so being able to keep on top of that is, is really important from, from an executive team perspective, under, understanding who's launching what and what it is they're seeing, um, you know, that their competitors are seeing that they're not seeing. Right. So I see these four, essentially four personas, each one with their own respective responsibilities. How do you speak to each one? I assume the language you use is different. Um, the, la the language we use is different. Um, and sometimes the, the analysis is at different levels of, um, uh, of specificity. So, you know, we, in, with R&D, it's, it's highly technical, right? It's, we're talking about shifts in 1% of, um, uh, of maybe high fructose corn syrup flavor, 1% in, in uh, cinnamaldehyde flavor. Whereas in brand marketing and regional sales, it's much more around consumer focuses and demographics, right? What, did it, what is it about this product that customers want to hear? They want to hear that this product is yuzu flavored, right? And that yuzu flavor is, what, is what's going to clue them into understanding the, the, the concept of the product and that the product meets that concept. And executive teams are really interested in, in competitive landscaping and understanding uh, what and why is changing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, I have one question from the audience is um, how easy is it for companies to begin to work with you, with Gastrograph? I, I think it's very easy, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, that it, it depends what they want to accomplish. Um, some regions are harder than other regions. Um, some product categories are, are more competitive than others. 
But for the most part, we try to abstract away uh, any concerns around data collection, data quality, competitive sets of, of products, research around top competitors. Um, you know, we, we try to abstract away anything that's going to add friction or difficulty to the process. So as long as the company has a clear idea of what they want to accomplish, right? And, and when, when, we, when we give the go ahead, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a complete product cycle. We're going to have a complete innovation cycle. Um, that's going to be faster than the, that they're used to. It's going to be more detailed than they're used to seeing. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's um, top level of importance to us to make sure that those results are actionable. Great. And the last question here is on this slide. Have you noticed companies asking for your advice and talking to you uh, that has changed over the, the, the past few years? Or oh, absolutely. Always, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The type, the types of questions, the types of problems that that we you know answer today have changed over time. Um, it's changed with the range and the extent of the data set. It's changed with um, key problems in the market. Right, COVID was a big accelerator for us. A lot of companies saw that they weren't going to be able to run large scale consumer panel or product innovation testing for a long time. Right, and we already had the data in third countries. Um, so the, the types of problems that we solve today are very are, are very different. Great. Okay. Um, two two people have asked on the Q and A is if this video will be available afterwards. Um, it will be, and uh, there'll be a link shared um, to to share the entire video. Exactly. Uh, so do do feel free to to share it throughout the company. I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying do do feel free for anyone yeah, listening uh, has the link to to share across their company. Exactly. Okay. So here we're talking about the platform uh, and, and the use of data. Um, this is very interesting. And I, I, I think it, 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 it's definitely multidimensional. Can you explain what you mean by reduce, reuse, and recycle? Yep, reduce, reuse, recycle is something that I, that I hope everyone's doing in their, in their daily lives. Um, this is a, uh, an environmentalist phrase that we've co-opted. Uh, when, um, when we talk about reduce, reuse, recycle, we're talking about the value and the efficacy of data. And so what moving from a, um, a, a traditional sensory methodologies to a predictive methodology, what that allows you to do is reduce the total amount of sensory data that you have to collect. It allows you to reuse that sensory data uh, over time, and it allows you to recycle that sensory data for new applications. So when we talk about reducing sensory data, um, we only need uh, about uh, 20 servings uh, of a product. Sometimes we can do even less uh, in order to test and in, over, in order to profile that globally. Um, we can reuse that data to answer uh, new questions. Um, and so if you want to add products to the test, if you say, if you want to ask new scenario models, if you say, well, what would happen if we switched from lemon to lime? Uh, we can do that without new testing. And then we can recycle that data. So if you say, this was a great success, we launched that product here in the US and it did great. Uh, I wanna bring that product to the EU, right? Uh, we can then reuse that data without reprofile. And so the idea here is to really abstract away uh, all of the concerns around data collection, all of the concerns around what data that you need, all of the concerns around experimental design, because if we already have the data we can reduce the amount that we need. We can re reuse that data for multiple things and we can recycle that data for new projects in the future. Right, okay. Um, I, I, you know, in terms of the data, I, I assume that in the current economic situation, maximizing data, um, using data across the portfolio of products that, that, that companies have has got to be more and more important. You, you cited COVID is an example where they couldn't actually access data, but they were able to go to you for answers. Um, do you agree that in today's world, uh, using data this way is um, not just efficient, but it highly effective for companies, which they don't get, I assume, from traditional methods? Yeah, I, I don't think that there's any way that, that we can get around the fact that um, the way that consumer sensory testing is done today, right, is a cost center. It is something that uh, companies have to pay in money to do. Um, it becomes increasingly expensive. Some countries are more expensive than others. 
Um, if you have, you have to determine whether you're going to do screened things and the more strict your screener, the less usable that data is uh, for, for any additional findings, right? And um, yeah, I think that, you know, the, the, the economic argument here is that we take that data set, that, that cost center and we turn it into a strategic asset, right? Um, we make sure that all of the data that we're collecting, we're going to be able to, to, to leverage and learn from. And, and there's actually two questions in, from, the, from the audience that are relevant to this. Um, one question is, will sensory data become out of date with the new generation of young people's tastes in the next decade? Uh, the answer to that is certainly. Consumer preference is constantly evolving and we actually return to all of the countries that we profile uh, within, within three years. Um, so we, we, you know, we can't end our data collection. We have our standing panels in New York and Shanghai, but that team that circles the world, uh, they'll still be circling the world in, in a year from now, in two years from now, um, in order to make sure that our data stays up to date. You know, macro level trends, variations in what it means for a product to be balanced, sweet versus salty versus bitter. Those things tend to be decade long cycles with about a three year gap between leading edge and lagging tail. Um, but micro level trends, things like is mango going to be more popular than, than guava this summer season for tropical fruit flavored beverages? Well, you know, it depends what, who's making what product, uh, how, how well were those products formulated, right? Uh, how well, how many people are going to be exposed to those flavors and be able to, um, you know, to, to, to recall that, that was their preference. So I would say, um, yeah, I would, I would absolutely say, say yes to that. Um, the, the other so, question, so, oh, go, go ahead, Jerry, go ahead. I was going to say the other question was that, uh, do we have a parallel path example, um, developing the same product using traditional methods and using grass gastrograph? And we do, um, something that we're proud of and something that we, we talk about, uh, when we get the chance, like right now, which is our validation study. Uh, you can find that, um, on our website in our blog, um, in our research. Uh, it's a validation study we did with um, Ajinomoto Foods Limited and very interesting, uh, you know, very interesting conclusions that I think uh, certainly our discussion today have, have clarified and, and confirmed. Um, was there another question that you wanted to answer at that level or no? No, that was, that was the question. I think this is, this is our second to last slide. Uh, right. And, you know, that's, that's really the idea that, that data is the future, right. Um, right? We've seen the way that data has transformed other industries. Um, and uh, we, we believe that we'll be the company that transforms the future um, for using machine learning, or artificial intelligence, for building up a data-driven approach for product development and product testing. Um, but if it's not us, it's happening, right? With, with or without us. Um, we, we, we believe that this transformation of the industry is inevitable. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and talk about inevitability. Everyone seems to be speaking about the inevitability of flavor. <laughs> They're all talking about AI flavor profiling. They're talking about flavor as king, right? Flavor is the, the one differentiator that at the end of the day is really going to magnetize consumers or demagnetize consumers as the case may be. Um, traditional methods fall short here, don't they? They do. And I think what we do is something completely different. I mean, can you explain just really quickly how AI can create flavors that we've never even dreamed of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, being able to pull those flavors around the world, just like the India example, so, you know, when a company says, I want to, I want to make something new, I want to make something that's highly differentiated, I want to enter, um, you know, white space that doesn't have any close competitors, using the AI to push that flavor profile further and further away um, into a region of preference that, that a human formulator wouldn't have discovered, uh, I think is one of the most amazing uses of the AI. And, and having tried some of those products, um, many of them, which are not formulated for me, right? Blonde hair, blue eyed, Jewish, uh, <laughs> is uh, you know is, is is always an experience. Um, but we know that those products have have serious preferences and have gone on to be successful. Right. Great. Well, listen. I think uh, we're we're here. We've arrived at the station, um, and I want to thank you so much, Jason, for, for your time and your energy here uh, in discussing this subject at, at length. 
And I want to thank all our listeners and viewers uh, for spending time with us. Uh, we really appreciate your participation as well. And for those of you who've actually asked questions, thank you very much. Um, I'm Jerry Schweitzer. This was Jason Cohn, the CEO and founder of Gastrograph AI. And uh, we hope to see you down the road. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.